We all remember this snake. This is a snake once again with the prolapse cloaca. And I'm pretty much at a success point. So I feel like we've, we've done everything, but I want to show you the proofs in the pudding. This animal on and off has been in the intensive care unit for over two weeks, being in water baths. This snake is great now. And I want to show you, if we remember what the prolapse looked like and I was waiting for it to slough off, it did take a while, but I'm going to show you what it looks like. Here. Ew, you're touching with your hand. Oh yeah. Yep. This is, so this is that whole part of the damaged prolapse. Oh goodness gracious, yes. So right there, so as the animal was healing and I managed antibiotics and warm water and making sure it's really hydrated and putting into a very low uh, anxiety type thing where there's a lot less stress, this happened. This is great now. Uh, I have not fed this animal at all, but this animal is ready to go back into its normal caging and I'm going to start feeding. I'm going to use small meals, but I think it's, everything is looking good. video so you don't get all weird. That's not gonna help me distract myself. Yeah. So if you're wondering why there's an incredibly small snake in Kevin's hands, before the video started, I asked Kevin to go grab a boa or a, you know, like a mid-size retic, something that would draw the eye, much like Brian Barczyk would do in his video. And he brought back that tiny little snake. So welcome to my life, everybody. So I printed out all these amazing questions that uh, people ask in our comments section. Nibur Dabla asked this question. So I'm not an expert in any way when it comes to reptiles, but is it okay to breed those baby snakes with their father and with their siblings? Uh, what's excellent about reptiles, and if we compare them to, let's say, humans or mammals, they're far more tolerant. And it's very, very important to note. If I take gene stock and then I line breed it, which is ancestral breeding because I want to, you know, maybe reproduce a recessive trait. As I'm breeding that multi times in, it doesn't magically create a mutant gene. Let's say something for kinking, something for missing eyes, something for lower jaw problems, something for whatever. It doesn't just because you're line breeding it create that malformity. What has to happen is actually that mutant gene has to be in the genome but that's why you can tolerate breeding successive things back to the same lineage to get out the attributes because when you're lion breed, you're also working on uh, uh, bringing out polygenics and it's all these little triggers that may occur at the same locus site. But it's like little things making things a little bit more yellow, a little bit more this, a little bit more that. And a lot of times that's uh, those polygenics are associated with somebody's lineage, let's say a like pastel jungle. Uh, Jeanette would like to know, Kevin, why do you give the big snakes head while palpating? I do a lot of weird things. Okay, so what I'm doing, the trick is when you're palpating animals, whether it's a small snake like a carpet python, you're using the top of your thumb to go along the spine, and it's not that part, it's this, it's the tip. And you're feeling for blip, 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 blip. So for a larger snake, what I'm doing is I'm using the top of my head, and I'm using that to put pressure on the spine so I can take my fingers and get my fingers up into there and feeling bloop, 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 or if it's gravid, it's more like a big giant marshmallow. But I'm using that, so basically I'm compressing like this. But since, you know, it's a big retic like that, so I learned a long time ago I can do that for my bigger snakes. People think I'm strange, but it actually works. Brandon has a question. Could anyone tell me why my lipstick sun glow boa would have creases in its size, not wrinkles? Okay, so a lot of times as these animals are growing and they're, they're getting older, um, they're in captivity, they're getting a lot more of... Uh, the good things is, is basically they're getting a lot of food and you'll get these creases on the side and like it's a crease in the, the, the skin but generally those animals are quite fat if you actually were to perform a necropsy on some of these animals which I've done it's very shocking often to find out how much fat is in our animals so they're, they're far fatter than they would be in captivity I mean in, in the wild excuse me and as that's happening so we basically were expanding the skin of the animal, and it's uh, it's just how those creases work. Those are where the, the body's moving, and normally a thinner animal won't have that, but the fatter guys do, and you guys are taking, obviously, a lot of great care to feed your animals and spoil them. I think a lot of us do the same thing. Hey, Snuffles had those, right? 
Doesn't he get fat? And then Snarfles get does have that. Do you see these lines that I'm seeing through my camera right now that are on his skin? You see oh, them? sure. So that's it's fatty. That's fatness, huh? Hey, guy, don't make fun of me for being so fat! Uh, oh. So you have a chubby stick. <laughs> so, okay. So when these guys bend, yeah. this is like a point where their body will make like a crease. So... <laughs> Those are fat rolls. Yeah, he's a little, he's a little fat. <laughs> All right. He's, he's, I mean, not not obese because obese snakes are, are are actually bad, but he loves to eat. And the other room, he's been getting uh, more more meals. A few people wanted to know this: Can the intensive care unit be used for respiratory infections? The one thing about the infirmary is the limited space. So you could manage respiratory infections, but I would like to do is. I'd like a larger container inside my larger container and make it so the animal can move around. Because what's happening is, remember, snakes, as an example, do not have a diaphragm. So when they start having mucus in the lungs and they're trying to get it out, so expectorate the phlegm and the mucus, which ultimately fills the lung. And then uh, as the lung is filling, less of the dilated blood vessels are looking for oxygen to take into the bloodstream less of them are available because they're under mucus. So the blood vessels dilate and then the animal's gonna wanna kinda lean its body up, drain the lung, and then try to force that out through a little tube, out its glottis, and then out into the environment. That is where an animal can die. They can suffocate, they can get clogged up. If it's pneumonia, which is more like vanilla pudding, that becomes very viscous. And that very, quite easily will uh, clog up the trachea and clog up the whole breathing tube. So when we start, if we're going to put them on some shallow water, I like climbing places and depending on the size of the animal where they can manage themselves, but they need to have that height and you need fixtures in there that they can manage themselves and it allows them to help drain. If you don't do it, they'll sit in the water and they'll often suffocate. So you're speeding it up. So remember, when the animal is warmer, it respirates more. When it respirates more, there's more likely a chance of it suffocating. But that warm water of a tropical snake of let's say 90 degrees, when it does have a respiratory infection, it will actually certainly help the immune response. Jessica Grimes would like to know, what causes a snake egg to get stuck like that? Okay, remember the eggs that um, got stuck in um, Jeremy's snake? Yes. What, what causes that to begin with? Okay, so this, this can happen no matter if you breed one snake or you breed 100 snakes. It's the law of averages. If you look at a zoo, I think their uh, standard for the reptile program or animals in general is every year expected 5% loss or less. So when you're breeding, it can happen. And uh, I, I, I really, so let's, let's keep in mind, we are keeping animals in boxes. We're feeding them more than they would get than in the wild. We're also maybe they get a lot of calcium they are a little bit more static, which means that they're not moving around as much. So maybe their muscles are not as well developed as let's say a wild snake. Um, any of these things can happen. But what you don't see in the wild is you don't see these animals having these problems because those animals would just go, and go off and die. So you'd never notice it. But often it is no indication of your care. It's not a necessarily a husbandry flaw. I know as far as Jeremy's, it wasn't. He had done everything right. Oh, this one's for me. Kevin, how long have you been jousting? Um, well, I started with stick fighting, but then I figured I was going to involve another animal so I could rely on the other animal to be uh, more aggressive than I am. Actually, no. Uh, I've been jousting for a little while now. It's pretty cool. I think it's one of the coolest things to do. On, on horses. The trick is not to fall. All right, Wolfgang would like to know, would these eat themselves to death if you kept feeding it, or does it have a cutoff point where it's like, nope. Pixie frog, so Pixicephalus was an African bullfrog, and the largest ones come out of South Africa, and the smaller nominate ones are from Tanzania, or that area part of Africa. So, like anything, we can kill them with kindness, and this is uh, Ceratophrys, this is Argentine horned frogs, budget frogs, all the different stuff like that. We give them too much. These are animals that sit still. They don't exercise a lot. And what can really happen is they get really fat, their muscles get weak. So the cloaca, the muscle that cinches the butt, can get really um, weak. And since that animal is now ingesting a lot more, it's passing a lot more, so you're increasing those chances. But uh, I do like a lot of times, let's say if my monitors, I'll go through periods of time where actually as they hit maturity, I'll starve them for a bit. 
So I'll start uh, pulling back on the food and let them lean out and then it might heavier. Same thing happens with the snakes too. They'll go through lean periods and then other periods of time where there's an influx of food. But just, just constantly providing too much food is actually a bad thing and pretty much all things reptiles. Pitts fan would like to know, how's the baby ball? Did the fluid come back? Okay, so the baby ball python that was actually bleeding under its skin. This is an animal I've straight out of the egg, started doing something weird. It was a cystic animal. And I drained the blood out and the animal was acting great. You know, tongue flicking, you know, as, as great as it could as opposed to just crashing right there. And I managed that snake for a while, but it kept happening. So I don't know what that is. Uh, maybe a, a really, you know, competent doctor or something like that might actually know what that thing is, but just the chronic hemorrhaging, that animal died. So uh, sometimes animals die. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we're showing, remember one thing, we're showing you a lot of our procedures and I always see this little comment. Look, you know, you show these things, that means must mean a lot of your animals are messed up or whatever. I'm actually showing you what goes on. And when you look at these animals as learning experiences, so we're showing it and Donnie wants to do something different. He wants us to be different. I, of course, you know, share those same exact values. I'm always pushing that. But the better I can teach what I'm dealing with and how I manage it, the better it's going to help you to be a better keeper. But sometimes we have to show you things that happen even with a detrimental ending. Daniel Jason would like to know, what substrate do you recommend for ball pythons? Uh, I really do like newspaper, but I really like um, the chunked uh, cocoa. So let's say Freedom Breeder, their stuff, the chunked cocoa, there's other, you know, reptile chip or whatever, is really good because you can put a deep layer of it, you can moisten it, it's like a little sponge, it'll hold the moisture, and then it'll start drying out. I like it better than uh, Cypress because it's sustainable. There's tons and tons and tons of this byproduct of coconuts and coconut milk and all that stuff. So uh, it's really good. I like it better than Eco Earth. Eco Earth is too small, too fine. So my first would be newspaper. My second would be that, the cocoa block. Why don't we have the retakes on the cocoa block? I'm sure you have it's, a I, I, I'm, it's messy. Okay, so when we're dealing with big animals, we're pulling these animals out of the cages. All the bedding's gonna fall out. So that's why I like Aspen or something like that. Uh, I, I don't like that. I like the newspaper because it doesn't have all the dustiness. It is more labor intensive. We pay a lot of money and we put a lot of time in putting a lot of our animals on newspaper. Um, it just makes things, in my opinion, uh, cleaner and neater. I don't like stuff on the floors and all that. Don't you use that expensive white paper behind you? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't even use a newspaper, huh? Yeah. Oh, no. We buy, we buy non-printed rolls of paper, so it's expensive. Everything about knowing Rata is expensive. I will yeah. tell you, the upkeep is ridiculous. So when people tell us like, I can't believe you have a commercial in your video, I get very upset. You guys, I, <laughs> and what we make on the YouTube is little, little, little. It's, but it's anything helps because when you're buying things like rodent food and paper and all the bedding and the goodness, the, the frozen rodents. Oh, I mean, payroll's the worst. I haven't paid. <laughs> Look at them. Hey, payroll's terrible. Payroll's terrible. terrible. <laughs> questions for this video. If you guys have more questions, leave them in the comment section because Kevin will answer them. Make sure they're creative and good though. Don't just ask Kevin what his favorite color is. Blue. No red. Boing! What movie is that from? I don't know. What Blue. is your favorite color? I don't know. What is the airspeed of an unladen swallow? What is your favorite color? Blue. Well, after Googling it, I found out it's Monty Python. I don't think Kevin's seen a movie in the last 10 years. I have a bad feeling that Kevin's gonna become really obsessed with ball pythons this year, and he's not gonna have time to make really cool YouTube videos for you guys. So definitely get in the comments and tell Kevin that he needs to spend more time with Donnie, his camera guy, and make better content for YouTube so we can survive. I'm just venting. I gotta turn my camera on, dude. You didn't turn your camera on!